Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you here this morning, and a warm welcome to you. We pray the Lord will bless us as we meet together here in his presence, and we pray that the Lord will also bless those of you watching at home. Just some announcements for you. Uh, thank you again for your cooperation with those on the door so that you're able to come in safely and feel comfortable, we hope. And we had asked you also to cooperate whenever it comes time to leave. But thank you for helping us. And we appreciate as well those who are on the doors helping with that facilitation. There are some changes that have been made in terms of our COVID restrictions. Um, we're asking you to maintain wearing a mask while you're entering and leaving the church or if you're standing to sing uh, or even sitting to sing really if you would wear your mask uh, we'd appreciate that however if you're sitting in the pew uh, we you're welcome if you wish uh, to take off the mask if you wish to maintain a face covering then please feel comfortable to do that as well now I'm going to England uh, from tomorrow and uh, I'll be away for uh, one of my daughter's graduations. So looking forward to that. If in the event of an emergency you need a minister, then please contact the clerk of session. After the benediction, we're asking you to uh, retake your seats as we'll have a short presentation at the close of the service. So please. Um, bear that in mind. BB and GB have returned. We have announced um, those uh, details uh, last week and uh, I hope that any members of the BB and GB have been able to uh, get along to those events. Those are all of our announcements today. We read in Psalm 111 some words of encouraging us to come before the Lord and praise him and we read at the start of Psalm 111 praise the Lord I will extol the Lord with all my heart in the council of the upright and in the assembly he provided redemption for his people he ordained his covenant forever Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his precepts have good understanding. To him belongs eternal praise. And we raise our voices in praise and worship to God today. Our first praise is praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Let us stand together and worship God.
Well, let's come to God in prayer. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we gather together to worship you and to praise the Lord, the Almighty, the one who has made all that we see and us, but more so has also provided a Savior for us, who has loved us, who has lavished his grace, mercy and forgiveness upon his people, even as we do not deserve it. And so, Father, we raise our voices and praise to you with all our hearts. We thank you for the privilege of knowing that you have revealed yourself to us and the privilege of singing of that uh, privilege of coming into the presence of God. Thank you for your revelation to us, Father, telling us of who you are and of how mighty and holy you are. Thank you for your word that reveals to us who Jesus is and of how in him we can find salvation whenever we put our faith in him. You are the Lord Almighty who has provided redemption for your people. You are the one, our Father, who has enabled us to see your promises laid out before us so that it is possible by faith in Jesus for a sinful people to meet a holy God in peace. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you and we do not take this privilege of knowing salvation in Jesus lightly, but we come, Father, with humble hearts, thanking you for all that you have done and achieved in Jesus. We thank you too, Father, that you don't simply save us and leave us, but you continue to enable us to grow in faith and to grow into a deeper knowledge of who you are so that our worship and praise can be more meaningful. But Father, as we worship today, we pray that you'd remove any barriers to that worship. We pray, our Father, that you'd forgive us our sin. We pray that the blood of Jesus would make us clean so that we can honour you aright. And as forgiven people, be able to praise and worship our God. We pray, our Father, you'd bless us in this time together. We pray that you do us good in Jesus' name. Amen. Our Bible reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and from verses 6 to 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and from verse 6 to 13. Now, brothers, I have applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, so that you may learn from us the meaning of the saying, do not go beyond what is written. Then you will not take pride in one man over against another. For who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? Already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. You have become kings and that without us. How I wish that you really had become kings so that we might be kings with you. For it seems to me that God has put us apostles on display at the end of the procession like men condemned to die in the arena. We have been made a spectacle to the whole universe, to angels as well as to men. We are fools for Christ, but you are so wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honoured, we are dishonoured. So this very hour we go hungry and thirsty. We are in rags, we are brutally treated, we are homeless. We work hard with our own hands when we are cursed. We bless when we are persecuted. We endure it when we are slandered. We answer kindly. Up to this moment, we have become the scum of the earth, the refuse of the world. May the Lord bless to us this reading of his own Well, I want to speak to the boys and girls for a little minute. 
I wanted to have a children's address that could really get my teeth into, so I thought I'd talk about going to the dentist. Thank you. Um, I remember uh, having lovely teeth, and whenever I was a young fella, I used to be able to have the really good brushing motion and then having nice teeth, and that was great. And then it came time for a checkup, and I went to the dentist, and uh, I thought, well, this should be straight in and out again. And uh, he had a look at my teeth, and he says, I think you need an x-ray. And I thought, how do you do an x-ray of your teeth? And I said, how do you x-ray your teeth? Oh, we put this in those days, for those of you who work at a dentist. Uh, they uh, put a piece of card in your mouth. I don't think they do that now, do they? They put a piece of card in your mouth, and you had the cat, ha, ha, ha. And then they uh, brought this big arm down, and they took an x-ray of my teeth. And um, it looked a bit like that, actually. <laughs> Looks lovely, doesn't it? So there, you are. that was a bit what it looked like afterwards. And uh, I, I thought, my goodness, that's an amazing thing. Because while the dentist could look on the outside of your mouth and your gums and everything else, he didn't always know what was happening on the inside. And you might have had a, a wee bit of badness on the inside of a tooth you couldn't have seen otherwise, or there might have been something else going on. And I actually ended up, he says, you've got a problem. I said, what's wrong with my teeth? I brush them every day and all the rest of it. And he said, no, what, one of the problems is that you have uh, a tooth up here at the front that's actually across the ways. Instead of pointing up and down, you've got one that's going that way. And I thought, well, we'll leave it there if it helps me eat quicker. Um, that would do the job, wouldn't it? I'll, ju I'll just leave that there. Oh, no, he says, you can't leave that there. That'll have to come out. And he said, you'll have to go to a hospital to have that removed. Oh, my goodness. He says, while we're there, we'll take another four as well. And I said, what, five teeth? I had to get my wisdom teeth out, which I know explains a whole lot. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I had to go and get the, all of these removed and done and dealt with and all the rest of it. And I was actually thinking about this. And lo and behold, there was an x-ray on the internet of somebody who had a tooth going sideways as well. What do you think of that? Only this one's at the bottom, I think. Or it could be at the top. I'm not really <laughs> sure. I have an idea. Anyway, so uh, the, uh, the tooth had to come out. But, you know, the dentist wouldn't have known that was there if he hadn't taken a, an x-ray. And sometimes that's what uh, happens in hospital or in the dentist. They take an x-ray and they see what's going on inside that's not obvious to the eye. You know, one of the things that Jesus said he could do was see our hearts. And by that, he didn't mean the, the pump. He meant what our attitudes were really like. He could see inside us and see the motivations that we had, the real reasons why we said things or did things. And sometimes the things that we did were because we were jealous. Now, we can't see jealousy. It's an attitude. But Jesus knew all about it. Sometimes we think we're better than others. And even though we try and keep that secret, Jesus knows whenever we have those kinds of ideas. At other times, there are people that we just do not like. And even though we might smile at them, we have really bad feelings about them in our hearts. And Jesus knows all about that as well. And the way Jesus knows is that he is God. And he is the one who is able to see exactly what we're like, however well we look on the outside, whatever way we speak, whatever way we act. Jesus is the one who knows what's going on inside, a bit like we use x-rays to see what's going on inside. But he can see the inside of our hearts and knows what's happening there. And that's why we can't fool him. And that's why we need to make sure that we ourselves are asking Jesus to forgive us our sins. Boys and girls, we can't fool Jesus. We can fool others around us with a nice smile. But Jesus knows how we really feel about others. And importantly, he knows how we feel about God.
And the best thing you and I can do, whatever our age, is to turn to Jesus and say a meaningful sorry for all the wrong things that we have done and the wrong attitudes that we have had that have made God sad and ask him to forgive us and help us to change from the inside out. And that's really what Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, our Bible reading, was trying to tell people, if you're followers of Christ, you need to be people who aren't just doing the right thing on the outside, but making sure that even our attitudes on the inside are changed. And only Jesus can really help us do that. Well, we're going to sing a praise before you go out into the sunshine. And... Uh, We'll sing it together, living, loving, lasting. Um, are there actions to this? No, there's not. That's all right. I can relax. <laughs> Well, let us come to God in prayer. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you and we thank you for the privilege that we have of coming before you in Jesus' name at your invitation to pray to you. We thank you, our Father, that we can come and worship you in song, but also in our prayers. We can come and worship you in terms of thinking through what your word says to us. And we pray indeed that as we do contemplate your word, that your spirit would lead us into all truth. We thank you for the privilege of being able to be here this morning. We thank you for the well-being that allowed us to come out to church. And we pray, our Father, that you would indeed receive our thanks 
that we, that we have been well enough to come here. We thank you for those in Sunday school and those who will teach them today. And we pray that as they meet in the hall next door, that you would bless them and be with them. Our Father, we are also mindful of those who are unable to be with us today. We remember those in hospital. We pray, our Father, that you would draw near them. We pray that you would place your healing hand upon them. And we pray for a full recovery for them. We pray that you'd be with them in these difficult days as access is very different from what it used to be for family and friends. And so we pray that even as uh, folks are able to talk over phones or over iPads or whatever, we pray, Lord, that that contact will be still beneficial. But we pray most of all, Father, that you would draw near those who are ill. And we pray that even on this Lord's Day, that they would know you speaking to them. We pray for those who through age are unable to be here as they live at home or in a nursing home. We pray, Lord, that you'd bless them and be with them. And that those who today will see this service later on, we pray that you would bless them and meet with them where they are. We thank you, our Father, that your word doesn't go out of date that you yourself, our Father, can meet us whether we're in a crowd or on our own. And we pray that today, whether we worship here or in our own homes as we watch a service online, we pray that we would know the richness of your blessing and presence. Our Father, we pray that there may be good decisions made uh, in our assembly we know that there is much uncertainty and yet father we pray that in some way they may be able to continue to provide good decisions for the benefit of our community we thank you for those who are working so hard to provide answers to this pandemic and we pray that you'd grant all their efforts success Our Father, we also pray for ourselves that we would know patience in these days. Sometimes we get exceptionally frustrated whenever the political scene is not settled. Sometimes, our Father, there are things going on around us that test our patience and we want the answers now and we want everything cleared up now. But we live in a world where that's not always possible. And so, Father, we pray today that you would grant us patience. Give us patience with people. Give us patience so that we're willing to answer questions from people who need our help. Give us patience, our Father, for those who repeatedly need our sympathy and help not just a once-off. And give us patience, our Father, whenever we need to really listen to those who need to get things off their chest. Give us patience, our Father, in our work. We have to get along with people. We have to keep on sometimes with projects and ideas that are long-term and we would rather they would just stop. Give us patience with life, our Father. Enable us to accept things can't always be fixed in our timing. And sometimes we learn most as we come to terms with the different changing things around us. Give us patience, our Father, whenever our hopes are not met too quickly. And allow us, Father, to acknowledge that your God and you have your own timing. Help us, our Father, to be patient with ourselves whenever we are people who often fail to meet our own requirements or our own timetables. Father, we thank you that imperfect as we are, that you're a God who has lavished love upon us and that in Jesus Christ we can see the value that you place on our lives even whenever we don't feel very good about ourselves. 
And so, Father, today, we thank you for the opportunity of praying for those around us, for those who are close to us, and for ourselves. And we pray that we would know what it is to have the grace and mercy and peace of Jesus today. Hear our prayer today, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we're going to have a piece for the music group, is that right? It's a piece for the music group, O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. It's a lovely piece. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was lovely to have you back, James. Yeah. Cheerio. <laughs> Just a fleeting visit, but it's lovely to see him. 
We want to take a look at the passage that we had as our reading today and uh, to see what the Lord has to say to us from his word. What Paul is doing is enabling the Corinthians to have a look at their attitudes, their motivations. And what he really does is he uses their attitude towards him to enable them to start to see how far they drifted from the Lord. How the attitudes that they were showing were not Christian. And how they were actually doing damage to the church, even as they thought themselves by their attitudes that they were building it. Whenever we have a look at it, we see that he's able to highlight what the biggest problem was that they had, and that was pride. And pride was so destructive, they were using it as a way of judging others according to their own standards and their own ways, and it was leading to real division and real problems in the church. Their self-centeredness, where they thought everything had to circle around them, was causing major difficulty because they all felt the same. They all thought everything circles around me and my attitudes and my ideas and it was a real problem. Have a little look with me at uh, verse 6. Now, brothers, I have applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit so that you may learn from us the meaning of the saying, do not go beyond what is written, then you will not take pride in one another one man over against another. It's very interesting that the word for pride there means puffed up. And it's the idea of having an old bellows. You know what the old bellows were you see in a blacksmith's for making the fire go hotter? And it was blowing air. And that's what's happening with people full of their own self-importance and their own achievements. They're puffing themselves up taking pride in their achievements, taking pride in the, follow, the one they wanted to follow as their leader. And instead of it being something that brought people together, it was actually pushing them apart. They themselves wanted to be at ease. They wanted to be kings. They wanted to be well off. That was their focus. They wanted themselves to be popular, joining the right group, that was what they were really aiming at, and we'll see that in verse 10. But the problem was, whenever you take over God's rule as judge, and everything has to be given your okay before it's acceptable, then that leads to a pride that is destructive, and it really does a lot of damage. There's three things I want us to look at. And the first one is problems with pride and we read about that in verses six to seven there are problems with pride first of all pride is wrong whenever it thinks it knows the mind of god sometimes people will make a pronouncement that says god says this and what they really mean my is my preference is this and you and i have to be very cautious whenever we are looking at what God thinks is right, that we are not transferring to him our preferences and ideas. And that's why it says here, do not, in verse 6, do not go beyond what is written. One commentator quotes D.A. Carson, who says, keep your finger on the text. That's a great idea. If you want to know the right thing to do, keep your finger on the text. Keep looking to see what God says. In my early days of ministry here, I'd repeatedly say, open your Bibles, make sure what I'm saying is there. Because if I'm coming with my own ideas or whatever, you don't have to uh, follow that with the same authority at all as you do whenever God says something. Keep your finger on the text is a lovely image of what you and I have to do. We have to make sure we're not getting well led into making our own pronouncements about what we fancy 
rather than what God says. Now, it, it works in two ways whenever we don't keep our finger on the text. In one sense, what we end up doing is setting up ideas that suit what we're able to do and it rules out other people. On the other hand, there are times if we don't keep the finger on the text that we let ourselves off with something that God says is wrong. So we have to make sure that we're keeping our finger on the text. We have to make sure that we're looking to make sure we're in keeping in our words and our actions with what God says. And rather than making pronouncements about what we think God should be doing, we need to look and see what he says. We can't go beyond his revelation. If we do, our own pride will lead to rivalry and division because everybody else will be competing for the center stage as well. And if we use our pride to push the leader that we want over others or push ourselves forward over others, that way will lead to destruction. We have been the wrong judges and the wrong criteria as we saw last week. You and I need to live by scripture alone rather than believing we know the mind of God by our own preferences. The second problem with pride you'll see comes in verse 7 and it's where pride forgets the grace of God. Pride forgets the grace of God. For who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? Where did you get your gifts and talents from? Who gave you the ability to do certain things? It is God. Who enabled you to trust in Jesus? It is God. Who enables you to understand the things of God by the Spirit of God? It is God. Anytime you and I start to think we have got here by ourselves... We're immediately starting to think we're better than someone else. And whenever you have pride that forgets the need for the grace of God, then we start to think we're better than somebody else or we're at least not as bad. Remember the old saying of whenever you point one finger at one person, there's three more fingers pointing back at you. And amazingly, quite often we point out the faults in others that we recognize because we have those faults ourselves. We're constantly seeking to make ourselves superior. And we have to guard against that. We have to guard against feeling that we're more intelligent than somebody else. Or we're more successful because we have more possessions. Or we have more friends. Or we have a better appearance or we have more abilities than someone else. You and I need to realize that the gospel spells the end to such pride. And that's why so many people don't want to go down the line of the gospel. They want to remain their own boss, their own judge, their own God. Even the very fact, I remember talking to a man, that he objected to the word saviour. Because to need a saviour showed there was something that you couldn't do for yourself. And he wanted to be his own boss. He believed anything that he needed he could buy or achieve himself. And that pride would lead to a fall. Anything you have, whether it's your health and strength or the opportunities to serve or the abilities and skills that you have... Even the scripture says an ability to make wealth comes from God. They're all gifts of his grace to us. A common grace in terms of gifts and abilities, but then special grace whenever it leads to salvation. There is nothing that we have that we did not receive from him. And therefore, don't boast in yourself. Boast in the Lord. And that's the idea that we have here. We're to make sure that whenever we are coming to look at ourselves, we look at ourselves in terms of what God's word is saying, 
not just in how we compare to others. One of the most liberating things in Scripture is that we can put all judgmental ideas behind us. We can put behind us the ideas of how many social friends we have on the social sites. We can put behind us the amount of money that, that we have in the bank that indicates how successful we have been. Ultimately, the gospel enables us to evaluate ourselves in terms of what God thinks of us on the basis of how we have accepted Jesus and how we have recognized his love for us. That's what really counts. That's the problem with pride. Whenever we think it allows us to go towards being successful, it actually becomes a barrier to us being successful. And we find there'll always be somebody else by our own judgments who is better than us at something or other and we'll feel a failure. There's problems with pride. In verse 8 we see the confusion of Corinth. The confusion of Corinth. These were people who wanted to have success in the here and now. They were Christians. They wanted to trust in Jesus but they thought that all of the things that God promised about heaven they could have right now. If God wants us to be really happy, he'll give us possessions, he'll give us wealth, he'll enable us to have power and authority. And that was one of the things that uh, we see in verse 8. Oh, already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. You have become kings and that without us. How I wish that you really had become kings so that we might be kings with you. These folks who are wandering around and saying to different people, here I am, I am able to uh, stand before you as someone who is successful. I have already achieved a great deal of friends. I belong to the right group. I am somebody who is here as a very gifted person. But God has already started to reveal that they were actually, instead of building his kingdom, destroying the church. They were focusing upon the material in the present. They were thinking that they had already reached the top of the tree. And Paul wants to undermine where they are at. And he says, I wish you really were kings. If the blessings of God are only material, where you have wealth and health, where there's nothing that will stand as a bump on the road on your way of life, what happens whenever all of those things are taken away? What happens whenever the things that you are boasting in fail? What happens whenever you think that you have accumulated so much and are really super victorious in all you're doing and you find somebody else is better? Here they no longer mourn over the things that they are missing that are really important. They're so consumed with everything about having a success in their own eyes that they miss what Paul says. You think you're already kings? You think you're already rich? Oh, I wish it were true. But there is a major problem. There's a problem with their pride. There's confusion about what's really important. And the contrast of where they needed to be is actually shown in verses 9 to 13 then. The contrast in Corinth. The problem of pride, the confusion in Corinth, and then the contrast in Corinth. The apostle comes along and he shows them a real contrast in terms of how being with God doesn't always mean great success in the world's eyes, but it does mean that you're still close to God. 
in verse 9 he says for it seems to me that god has put us apostles on display at the end of the procession like men condemned to die in the arena we have been made a spectacle to the whole universe to angels as well as men we are fools for christ but you are so wise in christ we are weak but you are strong you are honored we are dishonored what's his point there Today, whenever you're going to come to a wedding, normally the wedding party all arrive in and then the person who everybody wants to focus on is the bride and she usually comes in last. If you're at a royal event, you have to be there seated beforehand. And whenever you see the queen arrive, she's usually there as the last person to arrive so that whenever she comes and walks up the aisle of the church or comes into a big place she is the center of attention and everybody is there waiting for her a way back in roman times they did something a little bit differently they would have a procession of triumph maybe a roman general would win a great battle and here he would come at the head of his army he would arrive into Rome first and then after him and all the cheering crowds focusing upon him, he would show the men he had led and they would come after him and then all the equipment they'd used and all of that would be brought in. And then right at the end came those who were beaten, those who were of no account, those who were a spectacle, the defeated army, the defeated generals, the defeated kings. And they would be brought in chains in and paraded around Rome behind the successful general, behind the successful army. They would be brought in. And they would be shown off to the Romans before they were killed or before they were put into the Colosseum. They were of no account. They were the defeated ones. They took up the rear. What a contrast. Paul says, as an apostle, he is like the people at the end of that procession. Being treated by the world as of no account. Being treated by the world as if he had been defeated, as if he was foolish for following Christ. And it really is a contrast the people in Corinth thought they were the successful ones because they were going by their own standards and their own judgments. The people in Corinth were thinking they were successful as they were able to have their little cliques grow around them. And yet here is Paul being mistreated by the world, seen as a fool for Christ, treated dreadfully and yet revealing that he is the one that was walking close with God. The Corinthians had got so confused that they ended up moving away from God instead of staying close with them. Paul says that he has ended up being publicly humiliated, receiving unfair treatment, while the Corinthian church thought they were fitting in with society nicely. Which one's genuine? Is it the one who is a fool for Christ and stands up for what God's word actually says? Or is it those who fit in with the values of society around you? And that's what the Corinthians were doing. Corinth wanted to belong to the right group, so did the Corinthian people. It was all about self-achievement and what you had done for yourself. And the Corinthians were the same. But Christ is the one who Paul focuses on. He comes into the world and he talks about a crucified saviour. He turns wisdom on its head. The heart of the message is about faith and the one who gave himself away and died on a cross. The wisdom that he seeks is God's. The power that he seeks is God because Paul says, I've run out of my own wisdom. I've run out of my own power. I need to follow Christ. 
So whereas the Corinthians were choosing wisdom, strength and honour of the world, Paul became foolish because he followed the way of Christ that leads to a cross and death. He followed the way of Christ that leaded to weakness in the world's eyes. But that's really where the real gospel was. In verse 8, we read about the Corinthians, what they already think they have. And look at the reality of verse 11, says Paul. What we have, we're fools for Christ. To this very hour, we are hungry and thirsty. We are in rags. We are brutally treated. We are homeless. We work hard with our own hands. When we are cursed, though, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. Up to this moment, we have become the scum of the earth, the refuse of the world. Paul says, I'm living in the real world. I'm living in a world where uh, Christians may very well be with, mistreated to this very hour. We're not part of the in crowd, and so we go hungry and thirsty. We are treated dreadfully. But because of who we are, through physical suffering and hard toil, we reveal who Christ is because it has transformed who Paul is. While the Corinthians are scrambling to get themselves to the top of the peak, Paul is showing the love of God to those around him, even to those who mistreat them. What a different attitude. The Corinthians following the attitude of pride and of puffing yourself up full of her. And Paul, who comes as if as a spectacle, speaking of the Christ of the cross. There is a problem, says Paul, if you're in a church that's admired by pagans. There is a problem if you're in a church that is really big because people are getting what they want to hear that puffs them up. There is a problem. But the real Christianity, interestingly enough, that Paul wants them to see is not evident whenever people are successful in their own eyes, but in the midst of real difficulty and even of being abused, that they repay that abuse with love and kindness. Do you see what they say? The real evidence that God is with you is not whenever everything is just subtly going along nicely. The real evidence that Christ is with you is that whenever you are mistreated, whenever you're cursed, you bless. Whenever you're persecuted, they endure it. Whenever they're slandered, they answer kindly. Whenever they are mistreated as of no value, they are actually the people of God. We live in a world where some people will want to get their retaliation in first. That doesn't show evidence of God. Evidence of God is whenever the people of God still reflect the kindness and mercy of God even to those they are being mistreated. Today, there are churches that will say, if you come to Christ today, your bank balance will improve, your health will improve, your job prospects, your family life, etc., etc. All the promises of the day. But Paul lives in a real world. And he knows that if you're a fool for Christ, then quite often the world will turn against you. We have to realize that a faithful life in Christ is cross-shaped. It has a cross-shaped core where we are people who have the mark of Christ on us and it affects us on the inside so it changes our attitudes, our motivations, our priorities. It gives us a longing inside, not to belong to the right crew, but to belong to Christ and to see the finished work of Christ where we are. Gospel life is about Letting our own rights go 
and elevating others. It's about pursuing what other people really need rather than what we're comfortable with. It's about being humble rather than arrogantly putting yourself forward as the bee's knees. It's about using your blessings from God to be a blessings to others. It's about making sure that Christ is the one that you want to stay closest to above all else. Friends, as we profess Jesus Christ, may we be a people who keep our finger on the text. May we be a people whose attitude is transformed by Jesus so that we glorify his name rather than our own. May he be praised and honoured by how we live and serve. Now we're going to have our closing praise. And that is his mercy is more. Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, now and forever and ever. Amen. Mr. Garrett, Grandpa Ken, would you like to come up and join me for a moment, please? Um, I'm here 18 years today. It's amazing, isn't it? Um, I came whenever I was 10. 
uh, I'm here 18 years, which means, Ken, you're here 17 years because you came one year after me. That is correct. And uh, that was a, a day that was a blessing to us. I wanted to mark a, a number of uh, changes that are taking place. Uh, first of all, we wanted to say thank you to John Hawthorne, who is stepping down as elder after 19 years service. Uh, John isn't able to be here today, but we'll be passing on a, a Bible just like this one as a token of our thanks. And he'll hopefully get that later in this week. And we appreciate all that he has done. And then Ken has retired as an elder. Uh, early retirement, Ken. Yes. <laughs> Uh, and, and Ken is retired as an elder, uh, but he's also uh, moving, you know, moved house, had his first night in his new house and his new area uh, last night. And before he, he heads off, uh, we wanted to say thank you and uh, just mark uh, his service to us over these years. Whenever you arrive, Ken, you brought gifts and abilities that I didn't have. Um, I was a one guitar man and um, I sounded all right on my own until I had other people playing with me and then really everybody else realized how bad I was. But 17 years ago, Ken arrived and he brought gifts of a musical bass and uh, he was able to start to establish, we had a bit of a chat and he started to establish a little music group. He talked about things, about transposing things and all sorts of bits. I still don't understand it. But anyway, things you needed to do to bring a wee group together. And Ken used his gifts and abilities and he had a lovely way with them. And the wee group grew uh, over those years to something uh, now that we have as well that has developed again with James. So Ken was willing whenever he moved into the congregation to use the gifts and abilities he had and the congregation was pleased for him to use those gifts and abilities. And in those early days, we kind of had an, an agreement, didn't we, Ken? If the idea worked, it was mine. <laughs> and if it didn't work, then I wanted to know what you were playing at. Yeah. So that was kind of the agreement that we had as we went along. But not only was Ken involved in the uh, congregation here, but he was also involved heavily with Lost um, and that effort. And I have to say that not only are we marking what you have done um, in terms of a, helping establish a music group and then your service as an elder and so on, I want to thank you for your friendship and for the conversations that we have shared on a personal level. So I thank you for that. But as good as a congregation, we wanted to say thank you as well for your service in Christ to God. Over 16 years ago, uh, Ken was um, installed as an elder in this place. Um, just before Christmas, um, Ken's retirement went through presbytery. And at the request of the session, Ken was made elder emeritus, which is an honorary title where your service is marked, and even though you're moving congregation, um, you're still within the Presbyterian Church, and Elder Emeritus had checked on that. So um, that was uh, something that we wanted to do to mark your service. I want to present you with this very light Bible, Ken. Uh, we, we had a wee chat of what you liked, and you needed a new study Bible, so that's uh, for you from the congregation. We thank you very much for your uh, service here and we pray that you and Daphne may be blessed in your new home and in your new congregation as well which we think will be rings end rings end yes. and we mm -hmm. pray the Lord will bless you there but we wanted to mark that today so thank you very thank much you. and uh, I hardly know from all that I hardly mean you talking about was it I don't think I've been here 17 years and I must have been working uh, 17 years as well However, sorry, uh, but it's good, uh, really, in a way I'm sad to leave here, because I've met uh, lovely people who will remain my friends, I hope forever, and I'll, I'll be allowed back, occasionally I would say, into the church, yeah, I'm not there. Uh, but I, I really do miss the congregation, I miss the lovely friends, I miss the elders and committee men I've worked with for that many times, 
Uh, Reverend Jones has said I was 17 years as an elder here, but I was I think, 13 or 14 years a member in Maru Presbyterian Church before that. So I'm getting on a bit. This was wrong. I'm getting too old. But not to worry. I do indeed thank you, and I pray that the Lord will bless you all as you continue on your service here, and that many will come to know Jesus as their personal Savior. Thank you once again. Thank you.